All right, good afternoon, everyone. Did you eat well? Yes. Did you eat too much? No. I heard somebody say, <laughs> thank you for the honesty. Yes, somebody said yes. <laughs> Did you walk it off? That's what I should have asked. Another no, huh? Mercy. Lord, help us. Help us. All right, where's my Bible? You know, God is so good to us. Even though when we mess up, like eating too much, Ellen White has a quote. Now, I don't, you all have to help me out, but I read it somewhere where she says, when you pray, it not only gives you spiritual strength, prayer has the power to give you physical strength. Anybody else read that before? Yeah. Uh, there's been moments where I've done too much at the lunch table and I had to spend some time in prayer in order to be energized to, del to uh, deliver the word. God is so good. I pray that you've been blessed so far this Sabbath, and I know God has been good even despite and especially despite myself. I praise God uh, for the Holy Spirit. He has a way of preaching a sermon a hundred different ways, and he customizes the sermon just for you. Amen. He does it all the time. It's amazing. Yes. So whatever comes out of my mouth is by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then he takes that and edits it, and makes it custom for you, and amplifies it when it hits your heart. Amen. Amazing. Amen. Praise God. So I can sit up here and stutter. I remember one time I was preaching, my voice went out. So I was like, and now the whole church was leaning like this. My voice went out. Somebody came up to me after the service and said, Brother, that was so powerful, we heard the Holy Ghost through your whisper. Amen. And I learned that day that the Holy Ghost don't need us, really. Amen. It's a privilege to be used by God. I don't have to get excited. I don't have to do flips to get your attention. As long as I have the Holy Ghost, I'm all right. Amen. Praise God. So with that, let's pray for the gracious presence of the teacher to be here with us as he continues to teach us. All praise be to the Most High God. We just thank you today for your great mercy displayed upon feeble, fallible human beings. It's just amazing to contemplate how you would love us so. Lord, but we are grateful you do. We just want to learn to love you as you love us. As we open your word now, discuss what's soon to come. Give us an interest, Lord, for these topics, but more so a desire to get you, to get to know you more. Not out of fear, but out of love. We want to fall deep in love with you, Lord. And so I pray that even though we discuss end time events, that your spirit of love would reign throughout this study session. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right, you ready to study? Yes. All right, I got one yes. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to go, just me and you. Here we go. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here we go. All right, so what is Jesus doing right now? That's such an important thing to understand, right? Here's why, because the 144,000 follow the lamb, finish it out for me, whithersoever, that means they are on the same frequency as Jesus. They're on the same page in the same book as Jesus. Whatever the captain is doing, they are in tune with Jesus. They follow him right now. They are obsessed with Jesus. Will somebody say amen? amen. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Let's go to Colossians. I'm telling you, church, we got to be able to preserve our imagination 
because the power of the imagination is what God uses for us to behold his beauty. And Satan wants to destroy your imagination. The word of God takes an imagination. Did you know that? It does. Yeah. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind. You know that, who stayed upon thee. You know what that word mind is in that verse in the Hebrew? It's the word for imagination. It's the same word in Genesis chapter 6 that talks about the imaginations of the wicked, who was, which was only evil continually. So the devil perverts your ability to focus on Christ, and he put the root word of imagination is image. He puts different images in your mind so you're not beholding Jesus. So that scripture in Isaiah says, whose mind, whose imagination is stayed upon thee. This is why Ellen White says we need to picture the closing scenes and meditate on it for an hour a day. The power of your imagination. That's why the flood came. They no longer had the ability to focus on Christ. And once that was destroyed, the world is destroyed. That's why Satan, that's why we got these movies now that take the place of our imagination. All movies are books. You read the book and you're supposed to imagine what you're reading. They make the movies from the book so you don't have to even use your own imagination. They do it for you. Colossians 3. I think, I, I don't know if I went off, but praise the Lord. That's good. Amen. Amen. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. It, it, it's going it's to tie in by the grace of God. Look, notice this. If ye then be risen with Christ. In other words, if you're born again, seek those things which are above. Now, he gets specific. He doesn't just say seek to do what God wants you to do above and seek those things which are above. He says where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your, what's the next word? That word means your mind, and I think I have the definition here. I'm going to go to it in a minute. Let me come. Set your mind or affection on CNN. Is that what it says? On Fox News. On YouTube videos, no. on Facebook. No. Are you sure you're reading the same Bible? Yes. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. And your life is hid. with who? Right. You know, when the time of trouble comes, we need to be hid in Christ. He is the secret place of the Most High. He is the tabernacle whereby the plagues won't harm us. Those who are hid in Christ have their minds where? Talk to me. Now let's get specific now. It says, where Christ sitteth, seek those things which are above where? He didn't have to put that word where. He said where? Christ is where right now? He's in the sanctuary, amen? Most holy place. So I need to be focused on Christ and what he is doing. And if my mind is there, more so than the news and YouTube, that's how I learn to be hid in Christ. Notice the word affection. I do have it here. In the, in the, in the Greek, this is what it means. Strong's Concordance. I'm not going to pronounce that. I don't know how to. But this is what it means. To exercise the mind. Who likes to work out? Keep it real. You like to work out? Okay. I, I thought I was going to. Not too many people like to because it takes discipline. It takes effort. It takes what, everyone? A lot of times you don't feel like it. Amen? God is saying you have to train your mind. Because guess what? Even now as I'm speaking, Satan's putting distractions in your mind. He's trying to. Some of y'all falling asleep already. You're thinking about this and that. It's constantly dis distracted because of the life that you live outside the church. And so you have to exercise your mind. Notice, notice this. Intensively to interest oneself in. So when it says set your affections, 
you need to be intensively interested in Jesus and what he is doing. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. It's so powerful, the sanctuary message that we have. If you take the time to meditate on what he's doing, it will bring about, bring about such a spirit of repentance in you, you wouldn't believe. I'm going to give you just a, something to study on your own time. That's exactly what happened to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. He saw Jesus in the most holy place, closing up the work. And what did it do when he saw him? Woe is me. I'm a man of what? Don't you want to claim that in true, true and sincerity to Christ? That's a heart of repentance. Let me move on. So what is Jesus doing right now? Let's get into more detail, all right? Yes, ma'am, he is. Thank you for saying that. We're going to show from the Bible now, just for those who don't know. Yes. Say the scripture, Hebrews 7.25. He ever liveth to make... A so when he ascended, I'm just going to go slow for this. According to the book of Hebrews, and my brother quoted Hebrews 7.25, he began his intercession. Everyone say intercession. intercession. Now, I talked about it already. On earth was the altar, the cross. He ascends into the sanctuary and immediately, just like the priest in the type in the Old Testament, Christ immediately began a daily work. This daily work was a daily work of intercession, interceding on our behalf. Let's talk about this slowly. He immediately began at this altar of incense. Now let me say this. These articles of furniture, God put it there because we need to be visible. They're, they're, they are a visible parable to help our understanding with what Jesus is doing. There are so many Christians today that have no clue what God is doing and why he's taking so long to come. Do you know why we know? Because of the sanctuary message. I don't think there's any other denomination that has this message. They're confused, yeah. So watch this. You know why? Why? It ended at the cross. Yes, a lie from the devil, right? The cross was the beginning. He took that blood to sanctify. Hebrews 9 is the anointing of the sanctuary. You're going to get me going now, brother. Hebrews 9 is the anointing of the sanctuary. He died to get the sanctuary going because he needed to intercede so we can get the victory over sin. The cross, he got the victory on our behalf. The priestly ministry, he works in us to get the victory through us. Two different things. Now, he gets to heaven. He anoints the sanctuary with his blood, Hebrews 9. He walks into the sanctuary, the holy place, and immediately he begins a daily intercession for those who he just died for. And he's at that altar of incense applying the blood of his sacrifice so that, and we covered this on day two, you, he can forgive and cleanse your sins. He can enable you to resist temptation. He can enlighten your mind regarding truth. This is the intercession work at the altar. He can reinforce your convictions. He supplies all your temporal necessities. Somebody, somebody say amen. amen. He supplies wisdom. Anybody need wisdom? Amen. And he transforms character and brings revival. Revival, Ellen White says, only comes by prayer. Now, that's just one article of furniture, and I don't have enough space to name everything that that article of furniture represents when it comes to the intercession. Christ immediately says, I die for these people, but these people are still dirty because nobody was cleansed from their sins because he died at the cross. He had to become the priest to cleanse you from the sin. You didn't have the power to overcome temptation because he died. He had to become the priest to give you that power. So he had to quickly get up there to make it happen. Praise God for the high priest. There, I love this quote. Let me take my time with this one. There is an inexhaustible fund of perfect obedience accruing from his obedience. How is it that such an infinite treasure is not appreciated? In heaven, the merits of Christ, his self-denial, 
and self-sacrifice are treasured up as incense to be offered up with the prayers of his people. As sincere, humble prayers ascend to the throne of God, Christ mingles with them the merits of his life of perfect obedience. Hallelujah. The perfect life he lived on this earth, that blood he takes up to heaven so that when you pray, he mingles the benefit of his perfect life with your prayers so God could answer your prayers and give you the same power to be perfect. Hallelujah. Powerful quote. The candelabra. Just like the Old Testament, and I touched on this a little already, every day, those are the scriptures, the priest would minister at the candelabra. He made sure the light was always burning. He made sure, and that's why it was tamid, because the light was always burning. That means daily, perpetual, and continual. He made sure that the light was always burning, and this was a daily intercession, a daily duty. And this is why when you open the book of Revelation, at the ascension, you find Christ immediately in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. When he goes to heaven, his main concern is you. That's what the candlesticks represent, the church. And Revelation opens up showing you Christ in the middle of the church. I got something to tell you. He's still in the middle of the church. No matter how messed up, dry, stale, or boring it is, he's still in the church. Somebody say amen. amen. Christ walks in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Thus is symbolized his constant communication with his people. He knows their true state, their order, their devotion. Although he is high priest in the sanctuary above, he is represented as walking in the midst of his churches on earth. With unremitting vigilance, he watches. If the candlesticks were left to mere human care, the flickering flame would languish and die. But he is the true warden. His continued care and sustaining grace are the source of life and light. Somebody say amen. amen. There's been so many times, even this year and last year, where I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like reading. I felt rebellious in my spirit. And I even went back to things I shouldn't have went back to. But because there was a priest at the candlesticks, and when my flame started to flicker, he gave me grace anyhow. And it's only because there's a priest that I'm standing here today. He hasn't given up on me. I can't tell you how many times I've turned my back on him. But he's unremitting. He is determined. He is committed to fight with all his power. And boy, oh boy, he has power to save me. Hallelujah. He immediately began a daily set intercession at the table of showbread. Now, many of us, I don't think, have a complete understanding of this. And I'm going to share this with you. The table of showbread is deep, and it shows the intercession of Christ. Here's how. We know that the bread represents Christ. I am the man, I'm the bread from heaven. Amen. That's the scripture. We know that the bread represents the word. Those are the scripture. But we barely talk about the bread representing his people. Now, folks, how many stacks of bread are here? Did you know that the 12 stacks of bread represented the 12 tribes of Israel? I got so many other scriptures to show you this, but I'm, I don't have time. So these are some scriptures that show that the bread represent the people. When Christ broke the bread at the communion, he said, take, eat, this is my Colossians 1.18, he clearly says that the body represents the 
the church. He is the head and we are the body. So when he broke the bread, he calls it his body as well. We are the bread. There's so many scriptures that point to us. Anyhow, 12 stacks of bread, the tribes of Israel, which is the church. So you know what this is teaching us right now? Christ wants to become one with you. How does he become one with you according to the table of showbread? Through the word. It's a beautiful illustration of Christ and his church united on the word. This is why the promise in 2 Peter says this, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be what everyone? What does a partaker mean? You become, you share. You, you become one. How do you become one? Every time you claim the promises of God by faith, Christ says, I give you my nature. Why? So that you can overcome the corruption that is in the world through lust. Somebody say amen. amen. Did you know he intercedes through the word of God? Each article of furniture there that I mentioned is an article of intercession. How he becomes one with you. Let me illustrate again. When you pray, your life is messed up. So you know what he does? He mingles his life with your prayer so it can be acceptable. There's a oneness with his life and your life. The candlesticks. You're the candlesticks, but you messed up without the Lord. So you know what he does? He pours his spirit inside of you. One candlestick in the oil, you become one. The bread. He makes his, his nature available to you through the word of God. That when you claim the promises, now you become one with Christ. That's what the intercession is all about. Amen. That makes sense? Let me hear you say amen. Yeah, amen. All right. When Christ ascended to heaven, he began this daily intercession. I don't want to get too deep on y'all, but let me just say this. The atonement that he completed here, he took here to administer. The word atonement, you can define it, and I love this definition, is at one moment. It's the purpose of God wanting to be one with you. So the cross was the, was the bridge to begin the process. So after the atonement was complete here, he then gets here to administer the atonement. He then begins to officiate a daily intercession so that you can become one with him. And that's through the word of God, through prayer, and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I'm just repeating these things so you, you can get it. Now, he does a daily intercession because sin is a daily battle. Yes. Let me tell, does sin stop? No. It's not stopping right now. No. Tell me your thoughts ain't giving you problems every now and again. No. Even as I preach, Boom, some doubt comes in my mind. Yes, yes. I was telling the brother Jeremy, as I'm driving, sin and evil is trying to pop in my mind from the past. I'm on the way to church. But I'm so happy I have a high priest yes. who's doing a continual, perpetual, daily ministry, 24, 7, 7 days a week. Somebody say amen. amen. He doesn't sleep because sin don't sleep. And even when you're sleeping, he's keeping you. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank God for his intercession. Now, at the end of the 2300 days. All right, let me see how I'm going to do this here. Let me back up here. Okay, here we go. Daniel 9, 24. The Bible says that when Christ died, Daniel 9, 24 that he put an end to sins, transgression, and iniquity. This is the 70 week prophecy, Daniel 9, 24. That's what he did on our behalf. He ascends to heaven to begin his priestly ministry. And through the daily intercession, it's his objective to put an end to sins, transgression, and iniquity in your life. He did it here on your behalf. 
then he becomes the priest to do it in your life. The power that he had here and that was shed on the cross, he takes here to give you that power. And he shares that power through the word. He shares that power through prayer. And he shares that power through the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And this power is available to, both to you no matter where you are. You can be in the jail, you got access to the power. You could be in the submarine, you got access to the power. No matter where you are, or what time it is, daily, perpetual, continual, he's there to give you that power. Somebody say amen. amen. Now at the end of the 2300 days, he doesn't stop his intercession. He just takes on more work. You know somebody who works two jobs? That's Jesus. So he went into the most holy place now to take on additional work. He didn't stop interceding, he just took another job. And what he's doing in the judgment work now is cleansing the sanctuary from the sins, transgression, and iniquity that he's put away with in your life. Do you see the progression? Do you see the plan here? This is beautiful. All right. Now I really want you to think. I always try my best by the grace of God to make it simple so you can understand. Let me pray. Father, help me, help us, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to think. I'm going to read this quote, and let's just talk about it. You ready? Here we go. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 568. She says, speaking of Christ, he is today standing at the altar of incense, presenting before God the prayers of those who desire his help. Praise God. Now here's my question. Where's Jesus right now? Okay, then why does she say that he's standing at the altar of incense today? Say it again, Elder. Come on now. You understand that? See, here's, here's our problem. And be gentle with me, because I gotta help me Holy Ghost to say this right. We get stuck on location so much. But the symbols of the sanctuary are primarily to describe function. They're primarily to describe what he's doing. So when we say he's in the most holy place, it's to describe that he's doing a judgment work. You understand what I'm saying? Ellen White knew that. That's why she said after 1844 that he's standing at the altar of incense because she's not stuck on the location. She's aware of the function that Christ has two jobs. He's still interceding, and he's doing the judging work. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen. amen. Anybody disturbed by that? Yes? Why, you got questions? Any questions? All right. So in summary, what is Christ doing? You tell me. and judgment. Amen? Amen. Now, yes ma'am. But wouldn't he also be if some of us are like... Carissa, Carissa. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to get my question together, so I'm trying to okay. stutter in the mic. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so all of us are at different points, right? So some of us are still in the courtyard. Yeah. But Christ is there too. Right? Yeah. So as opposed to the location, I'm trying to figure out how I want to say this. I like that point. Ooh, that's deep. But at, it, I guess what we need to be looking at is Christ has a functionality in every station. I love it. And wherever we land within that station, Christ is there. Amen. Ooh, right? She preaching. Pre you preaching. Okay, then I'm going to leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> l l listen, l can I piggyback off that, my sister, before you say something, Chris? If you're living in the world of sin, you're not in the sanctuary. You're not even in the courtyard. Right. You're in the camp. Right. Okay. But guess who's in the camp? Thanks. The lamb. There you go. Amen. Because the sinner had to get the lamb from the camp. So Jesus is wherever you are. But the sanctuary tells us where you need to be. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And if you got lost, 
You got to look for the, all you had to do was, that smoke, you can't see it right now because this is blocking it, but the altar of incense would burn all the time and you could see the smoke for miles. You know why that was there to illustrate? That wherever you are in the world, just go to the cross. Amen. That's your starting point back into the presence of God. Yes, sir. Okay, no, no, Chris first and then the elder there. I was just going to say that uh, uh, God is omnipresent. Amen. So, so he's there, he's here, he's over there, he's, he, it's not that important. I praise God he was in the camp because I was in the camp for years. Actually, I was in Egypt. That's where I was. And some of y'all were there too. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus took on flesh, and that's the reason why he had to go with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit could be every place at one time. He can't pay the price and then take it back. But one thing, if you had a defense attorney, you had to go to court. The defense attorney is not in the court all the time. He moves around. His nail's not nailed to the floor. So Jesus does the same thing. Even though he's in the scene, he's at the right hand. He don't stay there for 1,800 years or Come more. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. So let's not get stuck on the location thing. Because let me be technical with you. Let me be technical with you. When you read the Day of Atonement on Leviticus 16, the high priest was in both compartments. It's not called the cleansing of the most holy place. It's called the cleansing of the sanctuary. All right, let's move on. I think we're on the same page. The question is, what is Christ doing? He's working two jobs. Amen. So what am I to do right now? I think that those who are in tune with him, the 144,000, those who follow him everywhere he goes, we're going to want to do whatever he's doing. Will somebody say amen? Amen. Now notice this. If Christ is daily making himself available to me through the word, I need to be like the Bereans. What do the Bereans do? Study. Let's read it. These were more noble than those in Thessal Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures weekly. Amen. Hold on. Search the scriptures every Sabbath. Daily, whether those things were so, I need to be in God's word, Amen. cooperating with the high priest. Amen. He's, look, he says we can become partakers of the divine nature, overcoming the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. Do you know what that means? That I have the power available to me to overcome sin. Amen. But I need, and he's daily making that available so i need to be daily receiving that amen. amen this is this is the easy one pray without what amen. that was the perpetual the continual or the tamid incense it was to burn all day so jesus says i'm standing here all day to give you credit for my life and to answer your prayers and to empower you with the power of the cross i'm standing right here and we talked about the set times didn't we on the first day, evening, and morning, and at noon. Will I what, everyone? Pray. Now, this is set times of prayer. This is when you go to the closet in your room three times a day, like Daniel did. You do that on top of praying without ceasing. Because that's how much we need Jesus. And don't get it twisted. I love this quote, Christ Object Lessons about the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This ought to humble us. Speaking of Christ, from hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Weekly, he received. Amen. Daily, he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus got to re receive this thing, the Holy Spirit, Daily? And he's our example? Come on, y'all. I quoted this in the sermon earlier. I talked about it. Isaiah 11, 2. This is what the papacy took. And they say, we give this to you. <laughs> when you come to our church, it's one of the sacraments called confirmation. But Christ is saying, I will give this to you. You come unto me and I will baptize you with the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord, church? Beginning of wisdom, what's Proverbs 8.13 say? Can somebody go to Proverbs 8.13? I hope I got the scripture right while I'm quoting scripture up here. 
Yeah, what does it say? Proverbs 8.13. Say it again, brother. Does anybody want to hate evil in here? We're naturally wired to love evil. We need the spirit of God so we can hate it. And it's yours. You know what really got my attention to? All of this did. And I'm going to move, I'm gonna move on. But counsel. Do you know that as a Christian, you and I are supposed to be able to give people counsel? I want you to meditate on that. God says, just as he gave Solomon wisdom, where's wisdom? Right there. He wants you to be able to be the counselor for people in this world and in the church. But you can't be a proper counselor unless you have the Holy Ghost. And at first, you know, when people used to ask me questions, I said, Lord, I'm more messed up than they are. Why are they asking me questions? I need to ask them questions. And then the, the Lord checked me, hold on, didn't I not give you my spirit? You're not moving on faith, brother. And if you stick to the word, you will be able to give sound and healthy and helpful counsel. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me move on. The judgment right now that Christ is working on is on the righteous dead. But very soon, it's going to move to the living. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary, I'm going to put some words up here. You know what it is? The cleansing of the sanctuary is the removal of sin from the records for people who are no longer sinning. Can I say that again? The cleansing of the sanctuary is the removal of sin from the records for people who are no longer sinning. Watch the goodness of God. This is why he starts with the dead. Because they're no longer sinning. Somebody say amen. amen. It's a stalling technique for us. I told you, we're going to talk about the end times, but we're going to see the love of God all through this. Yes, sir. <laughs> hold on, hold on, go ahead. If you're in a first day church, you're not really dead, so you're still... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, see, all kind of deception from Satan, right? But listen, this is why God starts with the dead. Because the cleansing of the sanctuary is the removal of sin from the records for people who are no longer sinning. Now, let's see this in the scripture. I think this is powerful. Can we take our time a little bit? Is that all right? All right. Let's go to Leviticus together. At first, I was just going to just tell you what it says. And I said, you know, let's just read it. That's all right. Leviticus 4. Let me know you're there by saying Amen. What's that? We all do, yeah, yeah. But you know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to take the most messed up, forgive this word, dumb, slow generation and turn them into his image and finish the work. <laughs> Praise God. He's going to take the slowest people and turn, and turn them around to turn the world upside down. He that hath begun a good work shall complete it. Let's believe his word. Le Leviticus 4. Are we there? Yes. All right. Let me read this slowly again. If the priest, if who? The priest. Okay, Lord. Every word is valuable. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring forth his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord, for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood how many times? Seven. How many times? Seven. You got to remember that. Seven times before. That means in front of. 
before. Are you with me? Yes. I lost my place. Let me get back with you. Thank you. Seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary, and the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of congregation. Now, this verse is packed. Now, so here's what happens. When the priest sins, he sacrifices a bullock, brings the blood, sprinkles it seven times on the ground, puts it on the horns of the altar, then he pours the rest of the blood out right here. Now notice this, what's significant. The Bible only talks about the blood coming into the sanctuary and being sprinkled for an individual sin right here. I'm going to try to say that again. For the regular person in the congregation, the only time the blood was uh, spilled, it was right here. The Bible never mentions specifically that if he was from Judah or Simeon or Issachar, that the blood was brought in here. Only for the priest and for the congregation on the whole. No, I said, Lord, why is it only when the priest sins that his blood is brought into the sanctuary? Isn't that a good question? Those are one of those questions that you ask the Lord in your Bible study when you're meditating and he'll give you the answer. You know what the answer is? What does the Bible call us? I think it's in 1 Peter. Let's go there because I don't know where it is, but I think it's in 1 Peter. So let's get there and we're going to get there together. We're going to figure it out. 1 Peter. I'm looking for the royal priesthood scripture. Is it first or second Peter? Second Peter. Is it second Peter, Elder? Peter. Right here, first Peter chapter two, verse nine. Amen? I think we were all lost together on that one. Amen. Well we got there. What does it say? First Peter, chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter two, verse nine. First Peter, chapter two, verse nine. Now, this scripture calls us a royal priesthood. Revelation chapter one says the same thing. It says we are priests and kings. I'll read it to you. I think I know where this one's at. One six, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Then it dawned on me. When you claim to believe in Jesus, he says he makes you a priest. Only the believer's sins are recorded in the sanctuary. Are you with me? Only the believer's sins are recorded in the sanctuary. That's why the Bible only mentions the priest when the priest sins, because you're the priest. Now, I think this is so interesting. I love details. I don't know about you. Amen. So they sprinkle it seven times. That's how the sins are brought in to the sanctuary. Now, why does they sprinkle it on the ground and on the horns? That's how a record, it's a record of a sin that has occurred. Let me read this scripture to you. It's Jeremiah 17, verse 1, to talk about the horns. Jeremiah 17, verse 1. Notice what it says. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altar. Do you see that? What about the ground? Why is it sprinkled on the ground? Remember the story with Cain and Abel and what God said about Abel's blood? He said, and he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the what everyone so when they when the priest sprinkled the blood on the ground 
It was a record of a crime that occurred. Are you with me? When he put it on the horns, it was a record of a sin that was forgiven. Any questions so far? What you got, brother? Loud and clear. I just want to make a point to the bull's horns. Jesus runs to everyone, to all four corners of the earth, the bull's horns. Amen. That's what they represent. North, south, east, and west. He has the power to answer your prayers wherever you are in the world. Four represents universality. Absolutely. All right. So, in the daily services, the record of sins was put here. When the believer sinned, there was a record of it kept in the sanctuary in the daily services. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record. It would stand on what, everyone? In the sanctuary until the final atonement. You know what non-Adventists preach? And they, t they talk about us bad. Because they say, you Adventists don't believe that you're truly forgiven. You believe that Jesus hangs on to your sin in the judgment and that when you mess up, he's going to put it back on your head. Now, is that what the Day of Atonement teaches us? It's beautiful what Christ is doing in the Day of Atonement. There's a reason that he forgives you. I don't know if I have the slide here, but yeah. What he does is that when the priest would sin and the blood was sprinkled in the sanctuary, that priest who sinned was walking out there shouting hallelujah because his sin was forgiven and he was not condemned. But there was a record there. Now that record was not for God to be an Indian giver. That record is not for God to, to hold a grudge over you, to put it back on your head. It's for another reason. Let me get to that reason first. Leviticus 16, verse 14. Watch this. Now this is the Day of Atonement. And he, the high priest, shall take of the blood of the bullock, this is when he goes into the most holy place, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. So let me illustrate for you, okay? I'm walking into the sanctuary. Table of showbread is here. Candelabra's here. The altar of incense is in front of me. I get behind the curtain. I'm standing at the Ark of the Covenant. I go this way, and I sprinkle it eastward upon the mercy seat. Now, why is he sprinkling it eastward? How many entrance, entrances and exits are there in the sanctuary? Who's standing at the entrance afflicting their soul? The people. He's sprinkling the blood in the direction of the people. Isn't that powerful? So he, he does, he sprinkles it eastward on the mercy seat. Then, let me finish re reading the verse. Oh, it's right here. And before the mercy seat, which is in front of the mercy seat, shall he sprinkle of the blood how many times? So it's hitting the ground seven times on the Day of Atonement. Now, this is powerful to me. So this is what he does. He walks in there, he sprinkles it on the mercy seat eastward, the direction of the people, and then he sprinkles it on the ground seven times. Why? How many times was it sprinkled here whenever the priest sinned? Each time you sinned, there was a record put there and it was sprinkled seven times. Now on the Day of Atonement, which is the cleansing of the sanctuary, he sprinkles it seven times in the most holy place as a symbolic act of cleansing the record that was placed on the other side throughout the year. Does that make sense? All right, look at the graphic there. I put some work into this. Check this out. This is Watch this. So he sprinkles it, and as soon as it hits the ground, symbolically, it cleanses the record that was placed. Amen? Does that make sense? God is into symbolism here. Now, what does he do now with those sins that he's taken off the sanctuary? And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the priest, of the believer. 
of the live goat, this is Azazel, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send them away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Somebody say amen. amen. So why does God keep a record of our forgiven sins according to what we read? Say it again. Justice. Say it louder. Justice. Justice. To put it on the head. Hold on, Elder. Go ahead, Elder. Go ahead. Even though we're forgiven of those sins, and that's beautiful, someone still must pay for those sins. That's the part sometimes we forget. Yeah, you're forgiven. You broke the neighbor's window. We, we, we forgive you, but somebody still got to pay for it. Yeah. And that's the part that Jesus does beautiful for those uh, evangelicals who don't understand the sin is transferred it's the cleansing of the sanctuary but it's the blotting out of our individual sins and someone which the devil don't want you to know that if you don't get your sins cleansed and blotted out you're going to pay for those sins but if your sins are blotted out he's going to pay for it that's what he don't want yeah. you to know yeah yeah and here's what the uh, first day people will say Jesus paid for our sins on the cross so here's how you talk about that. Here's how you explain what God is doing here. God forgives us, Amen. but we got a record there. But guess what? Satan is an accomplice in sin. Look, brother, if me, if me and you go to the bank right now, and I drive you to the bank, and you go and stick up the bank, we both going down. You know why? Because I drove you to the bank. Who's ultimately responsible for sin? The devil. So though God forgives us, he's a God of justice. He's not going to let the accomplice slide. So he holds all the sins on record, not to put on your head, but to put on the accomplice head. Because he's not being judged right now. He's running around driving you to sin, driving me to sin. And we get to suffering the consequences and he's doing his dirty work. God says, no, I got you. Every sin you drove Adam to is right there. And you're going to burn for it, brother. Justice. That's why, you know what we sing about God? Lord, help me. Revelation. Let's go. It's somewhere in Revelation. We're going to find it. <laughs> Revelation. Notice the song we sing. I just, it just popped into my head. Um, where's the song of Moses at, y'all? No, I don't think. Is it 14? I think it's is it 15. I just want to show you this one point. Right here. 15 verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of the God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. What's the next word? Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Somebody say amen. amen. God does not forget anything that Satan has tempted you to do, and that's why it's there. Praise the Lord. All right. So he cleanses the record of the sin, and then he puts it on Satan's head to be accountable for everything that he has done. And this is why God, the Lord Jesus right now, is starting with the righteous dead. He's cleansing their records first because they're no longer sprinkling sins here. This is the daily experience of what happened every day, sins were sprinkled here. The dead people are not sinning anymore, so he can clean their record up and that's what he's doing now. But very soon, he's going to move to the living. So guess what we got to stop doing? <laughs> you see, when you understand the sanctuary, you understand the gospel. And this is why Satan don't want nobody to understand, because he knows he's going to be held accountable for all those records. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease, thank God he's still going, in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Amen. Their robes must be spotless. Amen. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent efforts, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, 
while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work. Hey, what kind of work? Special work. Of purification, of putting away sin among God's people on earth. So what am I to do right now? Somebody tell me. Two things. I need to cooperate with Christ in his daily intercession, which means I need to be like a Berean in the word every day to receive his nature. I need to be in constant communication to receive his grace and power. And I need the fullness of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 11, verse 2, so I can shine in this world like I'm supposed to be. And on top of that, I need to do a work of putting away sin because it's the judgment hour. If that's clear to me here, say amen. amen. We're just copying Jesus. That's what we're doing. And I think it's simple when you look at it that way. All right, so when does the judgment shift to the living? All right. Y'all doing all right out there? You want to you stand up for a little bit? Everybody want to stand up? Yes. Stand up. Just stand up. If you want to stretch a little bit. I know. Yeah, do your thing. Just don't elbow your neighbor. Amen. Amen. We're almost done. We're coming. I think we got two questions. And we, we're almost done. All right. Amen. If you got some water, drink some water. I know it's been a long, strong Sabbath. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Are you learning something? Amen. All right. Let's pray again. Father, take us home, Lord. Take us home, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. When does the judgment shift to the living? Revelation 14. Everybody there. I think this is so important to understand, and I think it's been staring us in the face the whole time, and we just haven't seen it. Now, before we get to Revelation 14 and look at the three angels' messages, this is the three angels' messages, by the way, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the last message of mercy, and um, this is the message we are to preach and live. So I want you to understand now, I just want you to go to Revelation 14 and understand where the three angels' messages is placed and in the context of where it's placed. Here's what I mean. Before you get to Revelation 14, you have Revelation 13. How does Revelation 13 end? What's going on in Revelation 13 at the end? What crisis? The mark of the beast crisis is at the end of Revelation 13. Amen? Amen. Revelation 14. Verses 1 through 5 describes the people, called the 144,000, that will be produced during the crisis, that will be revealed during the crisis. Are you with me? Is that true or not? Amen. Now, here's my next, here's my next point. Revelation 14 is the three angels' messages, 6 through 12. Then after Revelation 14, you have Revelation 15, which is the close of probation, which tells you that this message is the last message before the close of probation during the Sunday law crisis. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen. amen. And proclaimed by the 144,000 who will exist during the crisis. Now, more questions for you. The second angel which begins with verse, what, eight? Let me read it, and then I got a question for you. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Here's my question, Bible students. When will this verse be completely fulfilled? When will Babylon fall and hit the ground? Which is during what crisis? No. Elder was right, Revelation 18. Babylon does not completely fall until the Sunday law crisis. So I want you to understand this. The second angel's message has its complete fulfillment during the Sunday law crisis. Revelation 18 is what my elder said. He's absolutely right. Let me read this quote. Not yet, however, can it be said 
that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. Not until this condition shall be reached. Watch this. And the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished through Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. Let me ask you a question. When will the union of the church and the world be fully accomplished? What's the name of that crisis? Now notice, this is not the national. This is the universal Sunday law. Because the universal is every nation. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's the second angel's message. It's proclaiming the fall of Babylon during the universal Sunday law. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. I just want you to understand our message. So the second angel's message has its fulfillment in the Sunday law crisis. What about the third? I think this is a gimme. This is an easy one, right? Third angel's message is 9 through 12, right? And there followed another angel saying, I'm sorry. And the third angel followed him saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Let me stop right there. Automatically, this message is talking about people not receiving the mark. It's warning them not to worship the beast and his image. Question, has the image of the beast completely formed right now? So when will this message be completely fulfilled? When will the third angel's message be completely fulfilled? You guys are saying it like you don't believe it. I heard, I heard it during the National Sunday Law Crisis. Because that's when the image of the beast will be built. That's when the warning will really have an effect. If this is making sense, let me hear you say amen. All right. So here's the point I'm making. The three angels' messages are in the context of the future crisis. And it's given to the 144,000 who will exist during the Sunday law crisis. The second angel's message is fulfilled during the Sunday law's crisis. The third angel's message is fulfilled during the Sunday law's crisis. So let me ask you a question. What about the first? Now let me rewind, just in case some of you are getting concerned. I believe with all my heart that when this message was proclaimed in 1843, it was of the Lord. The same message, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That message that was declared in 1843 announced the judgment of the dead. During the Sunday law crisis, God is going to use the same message to announce the judgment of the living. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen. If it doesn't, raise your hand and ask questions. Yes, ma'am. What's that? You lost where? You got to tell me. Hold on, hold on. Okay, I got, went, oh. I don't want everybody to know I'm lost. <laughs> it's all right. We're going to help each other. <laughs> um, okay, so I got the, when the universal, okay, the second angel, when Babylon is fallen, that is completed when the universal Sunday law occurs. Okay, and then you said the third angel message that is completed when the national Sunday law. I would say yes, because that's occurs. when the warning goes out. As soon as the Sunday law comes, then I would say yes. Okay. It doesn't so, specify all nations in, that, in those verses. Okay, yeah. so then this first angel, you said something about 18 Okay, something. I threw you off with that. I, that was for those who know our Adventist history. I don't know. Okay, that's it. So, yeah. Those, how the church started, let me explain to you. In 1843, um, William Miller believed and, and the Millerites believed that Jesus was coming according to Daniel 8.14. They believed the cleansing of the sanctuary was the earth, but God was so good. They were wrong in their conclusions, but the message that they preached was still correct. correct. Isn't that something? Yeah. They still preached the hour of his judgment was coming, even though they thought the judgment was the coming of the Lord. 
But the message that they preached was the announcement of a judgment. They thought it was Jesus coming, they were wrong. But the message was still applicable because at that time Jesus was starting a judgment work, but it was for the righteous dead. Be patient with yourself, sis. If you're new to this, just be patient. Get what you can, and, and the Lord will guide you in your studies. Amen? Amen? So the point that I'm making here is that the judgment of the living has always been in the Bible. Right. We will be able to safely know. Now, we don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We don't know. Ain't no date setting. Right. But we know when the event comes, okay. the Sunday law, okay. that it's now. I'm telling you. When the Sunday law is announced, I'm going to get one of those, what are those micro things called? When you, I'm going to get a megaphone, and by the grace of God, I'm going to be in Walmart, in the mall, and I'm going to be preaching this message. And I'm going to announce to the world that the hour of his judgment is come. And judgment starts at the house of God. All right, let's move on. I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this, okay? Just to solidify what I just said. Are you, you guys doing all right out there? Yeah. All right. Now, notice this quote. Now when the great work of, of judging the living is about to begin, shall we allow unsanctified ambition to take possession of the heart and lead us to neglect the education required to meet needs in this day of peril? In every case, the great decision is to be made whether we shall receive the mark of the beast or his image or the seal of the living God. I thought it very interesting that in her talk of the judging of the living, she mentions the mark of the beast crisis. I think that further solidifies that the judgment of the living takes place during the mark of the beast, but it doesn't end there. I got another, another thing to show you. Revelation 3.3. 3. And you gotta forgive me, I'm a stickler for details and that's why you're getting it. Revelation 3.3. 3. It's a message to Sardis. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what, what's the next word? Hour. Now, I'm getting ready to show you that when this thief comes upon you, it's not the second coming that this verse is talking about. When this thief comes upon you and you don't know what hour he's going to come upon you, I'm going to get ready to show you that this same hour is the same hour in the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment. So the hour of judgment is the same hour that the thief will come upon you and you don't know. Let me read this quote. That's why I love Ellen White. Watch this. We are in the great day of atonement. And if the investigative judgment has not already commenced for the living, it will soon begin. And to how many other words of the true witness applicable? Now notice what she quotes. She's getting ready to quote the same Bible verse that I just read. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I shall come upon thee. So what verse does she quote when she's talking about the judgment of the living? Amen. So the judgment of the living starts during the Sunday law crisis. I said all that to say that. What will determine my case when that time comes? What will determine my case? Well, what you said is absolutely right, sis. She said if you stop sinning. That's a perfect answer. You know why? Because what's going to determine your case then is whatever decisions you're making now. Whatever decisions you're making now will will determine the decision you make then. Now, the Bible makes it clear. You either have the seal of God or the mark of the beast. One leads to eternal hellfire, torment. One leads to eternal bliss. That's what Revelation paints the picture, very clear. 
But the judgment will start during that time for the living, for us. And it will be around the Sabbath, as I talked about in the 11 o'clock. And I'm going to remind you why. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the test. Every man will decide his own case. Can you imagine that? This is a judgment where you decide where you want to go. And by your decision during that crisis to the law of God, God will judge you with whatever choice you make. And that's what he's doing right now. He's allowing you to make your choices. Now, why is the Sabbath the final issue again? Because it's a sign of sanctification. It's a sign, my sister, that I'm choosing Jesus every single day. Amen. It's a sign that I'm daily cooperating with my high priest. Amen. It's a sign that I'm being one of the Bereans. It's a sign that I'm in my closet praying three times a day. It's a sign that I'm seeking the love of God so I can show the love of God and my light can shine. So if that is my daily experience, which is called sanctification, when the crisis comes, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. Somebody say amen. amen. I have a daily experience. And that's what the mark of the beast is all about. It's a threat to your relationship with Christ. It's a temptation to be separated from the one you love. And guess what? If you don't love them, you're going to receive the mark of the beast. But those who are surrendered are, and are one with him in mind, then are one with him in character, would rather die than be separated from him. Amen. Now, this is why I put this message together, all for this last question. Because when the Lord showed me the answer to this, I got really, really happy. Why would God judge me during Earth's worst crisis? Let me paint the picture. When all the world hates us, all the world is demon possessed, and they want to kill us and throw us in prison. When we're betrayed, heartbroken, persecuted, ridiculed, destitute, and abandoned, then God is going to pull up your name in the judgment and go over every thought, act, motive and look at your record of sins i said lord why you choose that time to do that and then i thought about it a little bit in my meditation and i said hallelujah praise god you know the scripture says and we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are called according to his purpose i started thinking and i said you know what if you started judging me before the crisis, I'll be in trouble. I don't know about y'all, but I'll be in trouble. Because you have to stop sinning. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the cleansing of the records for those who are no longer sinning. And so God says, I'm not going to start the judgment right now because my people are still sinning. I'm going to allow this crisis to come. Now, let me ask you this question before you make your comment, brother. What's your praying and fasting going to be like during the Mark of the Beast crisis? Talk to me. Talk to me. Come on, say it again, sister. Are you going to be watching Netflix during the Mark of the Beast? We're going to hear some anguish. Do you see God's plan now? Let me paint it better. How much will your soul cry out for God when the crisis comes? When people are trying to kill you. When your family members betray you. When your stomach is touching because you're hungry. And you look busted and disgusted because you ain't showered in weeks. How much will you cry out for God? The crisis is God's means by fully separating us from the world. And bringing us close to him. So that we can make it through the judgment. Can you see God's love in this? This is so amazing. Let me continue. The time of trouble, and in this context, it's the little time of trouble. She says, is the crucible. That is to bring out Christ-like characters. What's the crucible? This is a crucible. Look, you got a pot. You can get the pot hot. 
but the pot don't get as hot as the crucible. The trials that you go through is like the heat of a pot. It will condition you and purge you. But the crucible is designed to purify the gold at the highest level. The crucible gets the heat hotter than anything can get it. And that's what the mark of the beast crisis will be. It is designed to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. The last conflict will reveal Satan to them in his true character, that of a cruel tyrant. And it will do for them what nothing else could do. Uproot him entirely from their affections. For to love and cherish sin is to love and cherish its author, that deadly foe of Christ. When they excuse sin and cling to the perversity of character, they give Satan a place in their affections and pay him homage. This is how good God is. Now you gotta get the victory over sin right now. Somebody say amen. amen. I wanna make that point clear. But God is gonna bring a fire so hot that those who are close, one with him right now in character, only those who are completely surrendered, the fire is gonna be so hot, they're gonna run closer to him. They're gonna be so, they're gonna be all upon Jesus and Jesus is gonna be all upon them. I don't know about you, but I need to be close to Jesus during the judgment. And the Christ is gonna be, is gonna make me run to him like never before, pray like never before. And I'm gonna be next to Jesus and he's gonna be next to me and together we are gonna step up to the judgment seat. And he's gonna say, Father, He's right here, and I got him covered. He ain't over there no more. He ain't way out there. This brother's right, he all upon me right now. Let's go ahead and open up his books. Let's go ahead and clean his record right now and allocate it to the devil, because I got something special for this brother right here. Somebody say amen. amen. This is why on the Day of Atonement, the people were afflicting their souls. It was to point to the crisis. The mark of the beast crisis creates the soul affliction like never before. And God was illustrating what the crisis will do. It's going to break you to dust. And only those who have a relationship with God will make it through this experience. But those who cling to Jesus in anguish through this experience that's what it takes to go through the judgment. And by his grace, he creates, he allows the crisis so the records can be clean. And it gets even sweeter, saints. This is how good God is. Let me read this in Prophets and Kings. And bear with me, this is kind of lengthy, but this changed my whole view of the last days when I read it. I promise you, you better read this and you'll get a blessing. Prophets and Kings, page 587. To 592. Do this for your devotion tomorrow. Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force, and we're almost done, to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great day of atonement. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress. The assaults of Satan are strong. She's talking about the final crisis. His delusions are subtle, but the Lord's eye is upon his people. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but Jesus will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. Their earthiness, earthliness will be removed that through them the image of Christ may be perfectly revealed. The, the wicked will mock their sorrow and ridicule their solemn appeals. But the anguish and humiliation of God's people is unmistakable evidence that they are regaining the strength and nobility of character lost in consequence of sin. It is because they are drawing nearer to Christ, because their eyes are fixed on his perfect purity that they discern so clearly the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Amen. As the people of God afflict their souls before him, yes. pleading for purity of heart, the command is given, take away the filthy garments. Yes. The despised remnant are clothed in glorious apparel. Nevermore 
to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Their names are retained in the Lamb's book of life, enrolled among the faithful of ages. They have resisted the wiles of the deceiver. They have not been turned from their loyalty by the dragon's war. Now they are eternally secure, hallelujah, from the tempter's devices. Their sins are transferred to the originator of sin. Hallelujah. Praise God for the crisis that's coming. Praise God for the National Sunday Law that's coming. He's going to use this wicked time to draw you closer to him than ever before. Can you think about it? When they say you can't buy or sell and they cut you off from the world, they're doing us a favor. We're supposed to be cut off anyhow. Somebody say amen. amen. But we got some deep love for the world, earthliness, that only the crucible can purge out. I didn't say sin. I said earthliness, that only the crucible can purge out. And when you go through the judgment, he needs to get all of that stuff out of you. And even, at the, even when probation closed, there's still earthliness, she says, that needs to come out. What a loving God that he helps me get through the judgment by the crisis. I cling to him like never before, Amen. crying out, I'm gonna be fasting and praying, screaming the three angels message in, in Walmart until they throw me in jail. Amen. And then I'm gonna preach it in there. Somebody say amen. amen. That's why I memorize the three angels message. Because I plan to be without a Bible amen. in the jail. I can't wait for the Lord to bring me close. I'm coming to a close. Watch what he does next. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be what, everyone? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So notice this. He brings you through the crisis. He brings you really close. You're in anguish. You're close to him now. You're definitely not doing anything funny. The persecution now is going to weed out most of the church. Most of them are not going to be able to take it. And there's going to be a small few that hang on to Jesus. Those are the ones who make it through the judgment. And when they make it through the judgment, he blots out their record. And guess what he gives them next? The latter rain. I was always under the impression that the latter rain was going to come early in the Sunday law crisis. Nope. Nope. The latter rain comes after we go through a shifting time. The latter rain comes after your friends leave the church. The latter rain comes after your friends turn on you. The latter rain comes after you get some persecution first. God shifts and shakes his church to see who's remaining and those that remain get their sins blotted out and receive the rain. I got a whole nother study to show that. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, watch this, then the sins of the repentant soul who has received the grace of Christ and has overcome through the blood of the Lamb will be removed from the records of heaven and will be placed upon Satan, the scapegoat, the originator of sin, and be remembered no more against him forever. I want you to think about this. Here she says the latter rain falls, and it's at that time that the records of sin are placed on Satan. This means the latter rain falls close to Christ leaving the sanctuary. I want you to understand the implications of that. Let me continue. When it does fall, you will be eternally secure from the power of sin. So God says, let me create this crisis, or allow this crisis, I should say, those who remain go through anguish. They hang on to Jesus. They get closer. He walks with them to the judgment seat. He clears their record. And then to eternally secure them from sin, he gives them the latter rain. And when you receive the latter rain, that is when you know that your record has been blotted out 
and you are eternally secure from the power of Satan. Amen. What a God. You couldn't ask for a better setup. So let me recap what we learned and we'll pray. And we'll get into some questions and comments. What is Jesus doing right now? Somebody tell me. He's interceding and? That's right. He got two jobs. I love that. What am I to do right now? He got two jobs. What, 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 I should, what should I focus on? Cooperating with him in intercession, which is praying and reading the word and being filled with the spirit, right? Daily. And putting away sin. Amen? When will God judge the righteous living? During the Sunday law crisis. We don't know the exact date because it's a thief who comes upon your name you don't know. What will determine my case? What my sister said. Whatever decisions you're making now will determine the decisions that you make then. Amen? Amen. Why would God judge me during Earth's worst crisis? To bring me as close to him as possible so I can make it through the judgment scot-free. Amen? Any questions? Let, let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for how much you love us. That even when the crisis comes, you've worked it out where the crisis is going to be for our benefit. Lord Jesus, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. The scripture says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We want to be hid in the secret place of the Most High, so help us to keep our minds on you and what you're doing so we can cooperate with you in this work so we can go home. Thank you for what you've taught us this Sabbath. Thank you for being with us and your presence among us. In the name of Jesus Christ, let everyone say amen. 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 All right, any questions, comments, statements? My sister got a hand in the mother's room, but I don't think there's a microphone back there. There is? Okay. Comment? Question. Maybe I missed it, but what was Jesus doing before 1844? Can you hear that? I was hearing it. It must have turned off. All right. Before 1844, as soon as he ascended in 8031, he began to intercede immediately. Immediately. Yes. Any other questions, statements, comments? Come on. Okay, in the morning service, yes, um, you, you spoke of people who are not ready to make 100% surrender. Yeah. Those who are, they're, they're not all the way. Um, and, and you said it causes confusion. Um, you know, it's just not a good situation. Can, can, we distinguish, can you distinguish for me the difference between people who are on the journey to sanctification, they're not there yet, and those who, the ones who are not willing to make a complete surrender and are causing the confusion? Because it almost sounds like, I mean, I know that's not what you're saying, but it almost sounds like don't, if you're not entirely surrendered, don't come. Which, and I've always heard that the church is a hospital for sick people, and you know, yeah, he's come to call the, not right? the righteous, but the unrighteous. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent, excellent question. Because people are on their own journey to Christ. Now, what I would say to that is, as individuals, we are to move based on our personal conviction on what the Holy Spirit has taught us through the Word, right? Let me give you an example of that. When I gave my heart to the Lord, he delivered me off the drugs. I stopped the alcohol, right? And he wanted me to stop smoking cigarettes, but I was struggling with that. And I knew it was wrong, but I was still struggling, right? And I was in the fight. You understand what I mean when I say that? Yes. I was in the fight. 
I believe God respects you as, you're lo as long as you're in the fight. If you're out the fight, that's a problem. Now let me go further with my testimony. When he delivered me, I, had to, I, I listened to hip hop all day, every day, and I listened to real dance hall, reggae, hardcore music, right? And so when he delivered me, I had to put the hip hop away, but I started to listen to the nice reggae. Not the dance hall, but I would listen to like uh, Luciano, I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, they talk about creation and John, you know? And I was, you know, I had my 15s, my 10, I was bumping that stuff, you know, in the car, driving. Now, the Holy Ghost did not immediately convict me. And I was riding around, now, now he didn't let me roll around too long either. And I was listening to the reggae music, and you know what I was doing? I was rejoicing in my freedom. Because I was seeing nature clearly, and the songs I was listening to was talking about nature. Then one day, the Holy Ghost said, do you, do you understand what they're saying? I was like, yeah. Then he, he said to me in my mind, who's Jah that they're praising all the time? I said, Jah is you. They're talking about you. They're praising the Creator. He said, look that up. Then when I looked up who Jah is, and the, what the Rastafarian religion is all about, Haile Selassie, I, who's an impersonator of Christ. I said, hold on a second, these people are mocking the Lord. Their jaw is not my jaw. And once the Holy Ghost directed me there, guess what happened to my heart? It was hit with conviction. Now, if I continued and I ignored the Holy Ghost, then, I, then what I talked about this morning, that's that double life. But now he moved upon my heart in the right time. Now he's good to me because he just saved me from drugs. Maybe if he would have told me about the reggae music, maybe that would have been too much for me all at once. So he was gentle with me. Amen. He let me rock with it for a couple weeks. And after a couple weeks, he's like, okay, we got to stop this. Amen. The Christian journey is always one of progression. Yes. And as long as the Christian is progressing based on the voice of God, then they're okay. And we're not to judge nobody's progressive walk. Amen? Amen? Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Sorry, sis, I'd love to talk. Amen. Yes. That's why the Lord got me preaching. <laughs> Any other questions or, or comments or statements? Yes, brother. Yes. Um, I have, one, I have one, one point to make in, 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 in regards to the, um, the latter rain. Yes, sir. Correct. It says, I, I think it says earlier on that the latter rain has not started to fall yet. Is that correct? Amen. All righty. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a quotation from um, Selective Messages. Mm -hmm. um, she says, she said, I have, I have no specific time, I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place. Mm -hmm. When the mighty angel will come down from heaven and unite with the third angel in closing up the work of this work. Now, this angel is talking about the angel of Revelation 18, yes. which unite with the third angel of Revelation 14. So she says she don't have no idea as to when the outpouring um, of the latter rain will take place for this to happen. Yeah. Alrighty? Um, my message is that of my message is that our only safety is being ready for the heavenly refreshing. Having your lamps trim and burning. Amen. This is some selected messages. Yes, sir. Alrighty, so a few months later, she went back and she, re, she, re, she, 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 she elaborate okay. a little bit further on this same topic of the whole point of the, um, the Holy Spirit. Because in order for us to give the loud cry, we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, Amen. which rain. is the latter rain. Correct? You're with me, brother. All right, let's you. go. Yes, sir. So she says, the time of tests is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of Christ our righteousness. Mm -hmm. Alrighty? So now, what is the message of Christ our righteousness? A.T. Jones, 18, 1888, righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. So she's saying that it has already begun. Yeah. The loud cry has already begun in the message of Christ or righteousness. And we know that this took place in 1888 through A.T. Jones and Wagner. Yeah. Correct? Alrighty. So she says the sin part in Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angels whose glory fill yeah. the whole earth. That's from selective messages. So first, she says she has no idea yeah. as to when. Later on, she said it has already begun. 
Yeah. This is now is from a general conference bulletin, January 20, 29, um, 1893. Um, she says, now that angel of Revelation 18 is the angel that is to join the third angels and swell the message into the loud cry. So am I to believe then that based on the context that she's saying that in order for the loud cry to be given, the Holy Spirit has to be has to accompany the angel of Revelation 18, which will unite with the angels of Revelation 14 to give that loud cry. And it has already begun in 1888 through the message of Christ or righteousness with A.T. Jones and Wagner. So in order for that to happen, we have to have the Holy Spirit to give that loud cry. But I'm just saying, so you let know. Me, let me make a comment on the 1888. So remember in 1888, I think that's around the time that a possible Sunday law was in the works. Right. Right. So there's the, there's the connection again, right? So there was a possible Sunday law in the works. And remember, the loud cry will fall during the Sunday law. So she says it's the beginning of the loud cry, right? That message is the loud cry message. And I talked about it last night. It's the revelation of the love of God, his character, right? So she said it did begin because things were in motion for the Sunday law to come to pass. But the people rejected the message, right? So it was as if God in his mercy held back the crisis because the people weren't ready. So as it was like a, you know, in football, they have a false start. You know what I mean? So she was accurate because God wanted to unroll it. It was in that time, but the people rejected the message. God said, hold on, I'm not going to have nobody ready for this crisis. And that's why he pulled it back. Does that make sense? Yeah. They, didn't even understand they were arguing against it. There were, a lot of them were strictly legalists, right? That, and that's my opinion, my brother, on that. I, I don't know if that you know, satisfies anybody's uh, question, but that's, that's my opinion on that. But I do believe um, that the latter rain is the angel that comes down. Now, when you read Revelation 18, the angel actually describes the condition of the earth when he comes down. He comes down in verse 1, and then he simply tells you what's going on in the earth as he's coming down. And what does he say? He says, all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, for all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So when the rain comes down, this is what I'm getting out of the verse, it's during the crisis when all the nations are united. That's what I see from the Bible. And I have, I have some quotes from Ellen White as well. Amen. All right. It's been a long Sabbath. We are going to close out the Sabbath. I, I have a special message. If you're going to hang around, if you've got to leave, I understand. But I have a special short devotional message that I want to share to encourage with you all, if you do stay before you leave, to close out the Sabbath. I don't know what time that is, though. How, how long is that? We can time it? That's a good question. I, I'll say I'm hoping 20 minutes or so. All right. Well, we can just take a break now, and then we'll, we'll come back in about 20 minutes or so, because I believe sunset's just before 6 o'clock. Oh, is it? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. If you got to go, God bless you. Uh, hopefully, I got your email. If you can stick around, stick around, and we'll close out the Sabbath together. Amen. Right. Enjoy Amen. your break. Get some water, fresh air. If it's not too hot out there. Yeah.